Hi, this is Anthony Parent of IRS Medic. What if we had an individual income tax? It was the law of the land, but the word individual was actually never defined. If What would that look like? Joining me today to discuss this possibility is John Richardson, um, our longtime friend, a uh, fantastic attorney who knows more about this stuff than probably anyone um, from the legal aspect. And we also have Keith Redman, who probably knows more about this stuff from the personal aspect, helping expatriates around the world figure out the U.S. tax code. And this topic today came up because we are looking at the U.S. income tax. And this is sort of the problem I always have when people say there is no law that says you have to pay taxes. I point them to, say, 26 U.S. Code 1. And it says this. And let me do a screen share of this so you guys can see what I'm talking about. The problem that we have with this code in the way it's written, and it's always troubled me. Hopefully you guys can see that there. The way this law is written is troubling because it's not written very clearly. We all could agree to that. It says tax imposed. Married individuals filing joint returns and surviving spouses. They're hereby imposed on the taxable income of every married individual as defined in section 7703. Okay, well, let's go to section 703 to define to find out what a married individual is. We go down to section 703. We find out that a married individual, where are we here? Is an individual who's married. Right here. A married individual is an individual who's married within the meeting of subsection A and who files a separate return and maintains his home, a household, which constitute for more than half of the taxable year. And it goes on. But the only thing we know at this point about individuals is that they can be married. So what we know so far is individuals are most likely people. But people have a lot of other things going on in their lives besides being married. There's a lot of other things. So it seems what happened here, tell me if I'm wrong about this, John. It seems like what we have here, and perhaps I'm jumping the gun, but we have an income tax that goes applies to anybody. Would you agree? What, so far, what I've read. Oh, absolutely, Anthony. You're 100% correct. The way this thing is written, it applies to every individual, whatever that means, but let's assume that means some kind of carbon life form anywhere in the country, on the planet, in the galaxy, some alternative solar system. They all owe America. Everywhere. Right. Now, the law does exempt certain people. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So is that sort of how we find what a definition of individual is? We say, well, um, think of everybody. And now here's a certain people who aren't. Is that the, what the law is? Well, that won't tell us the meaning of individual, but it will tell us that if we qualify as one of the carve outs, all right, then whatever individual means, you're not one of them. Okay. Okay. So, so the way this is written, this is very typical, I've noticed, of, of sort of the modus operandi of US legislatures is that what you do is you create a statute aimed at everybody, it applies to everybody, punishes everybody. And then what you do is you provide some exemptions. In fact, arguably, arguably, the whole uh, US Constitution Declaration of Independence was that exactly right? Because what it did effectively was provided a carve out, uh, you know, for, for, for certain people who were, you know, basically free, not only from the British, but presumably from slavery and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, this has historical antecedents. I'm not saying it's all bad. Right. But the general principle of, of uh, carve outs, all right, is, um, you know, is really prevalent, certainly in the tax code. 
Well, I mean, I think this is sort of the, you know, the, the foundation of the absurdity, you know, Keith, uh, everybody that that we have been been, been seeing. And, and that's really the, the, the foundational aspect of this is that Congress wants as much power as possible. OK, OK, because now you really need them. Right. You really need them. You write your little check so they can give you your little carve out. Right. So now you work for them. And that's how it's been working. And so the foundation. And the foundation of the scam started with this incredibly terribly written 26 U.S. Code 1. Now, John, was this 26 U.S. Code 1 the original or was this something that later came on? The one that we're looking on now, when did this kind of come onto the scene? Um, I am not entirely sure, but I, what we're looking at now, in other words, I don't know, for example, the Revenue Act of 1921, which, by the way, was the law when the famous cook. Kirk versus Kate, Tate decision uh, came down. I don't know if that would define people as individuals being subject to tax or not. Uh, has evolved enormously, uh, you know, from the 1950s. Uh, notably, in 1967, the Aforium decision basically ruled that U.S. Congress could not strip people of their citizenship, you know, for a variety of things like becoming a citizen of another country or voting in a foreign election or something like that. And what this actually did, although, you know, it was never part of the decision, was it massively expanded uh, the number of uh, U.S. citizens living outside the United States who, you know, would be individuals, right? So the expansion of citizenship taxation, I think was a combination of a stagnant tax code that never really thought about tax residency, coupled with uh, a number of decisions on the citizenship side, uh, you know, which massively expanded the number of citizens. And then, you know, starting in the 80s, you have the a gradual evolution of the Internal Revenue Code to, you know, savagely attack anything that's foreign. You know, in, 80, in 86, we have the PFIC rules, for example. In the 90s, we have the, the foreign trust rules. We also have the uh, entity classification uh, regulations from Treasury that, you know, deem, for example, Canadian controlled private corporations to be per se corporations. Uh, we, we have the, uh, you know, the exit tax rules. Uh, and we, then we have the massive expansion of the subpart F regime, which interestingly, uh, really started in 1986 uh, in ways that are, you know, in a way that's never discussed, uh, which, you know, specified that, you know, that you had to pay a 90% of the corporate tax rate to be exempt from the subpart F regime. Well, prior to 86, it didn't say 90%, it said substantial tax, right? Well, nobody knows that, okay. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's, I'm not making this up, okay. So, you know, that was another a small change that, you know, created, which actually created subpart F income generally. And then in 2017, of course, we have transition tax and guilty, which we all know, you know, the modern day expansions of that stuff. So, you know, it's, it's really quite amazing how without changing anything in the Internal Revenue Code, particularly in terms of the definitions of tax residency, uh, basically uh, it's, I think tax compliance for anybody outside the United States who has anything more than a nine to five job or employment income is frankly impossible. And they're right in renouncing, they should renounce. So to restate what you said, you're saying that there has not been a lot of meaningful change to the income tax law itself. Rather, it's the ancillary things such as court or it's the, the court decisions and some other changes to what the law is that, and I would say this vastly completely changed the definition of an income tax, because if most people in 1954, their, their belief is that because, and here's the big point is that in 1954, there weren't a lot of dual citizens. You didn't do it. If you, Got a new citizen that yeah, was so waving you goodbye. US citizenship, that's right. You lose your U.S. citizenship, right? And, and really, and, and I think we we've discussed this before. It's really sort of hard to have two allegiances. That's called not having an allegiance. Um, 
So it really seems like something that should do it, but we've expanded the world citizen. We've become more worldly, right? More free as we're world citizens. And now we could be taxed by several different regimes at the same time. So that's really what happened. We have this, this massive expansion of what it means to be an individual because they never defined individual. Is that correct? Um, I think had they defined uh, individual, um, it would and actually could make a very big difference. Um, if I can just uh, make one point here that I think should be injected into the discussion right now, right? So the carve out is section two, non-resident aliens, right? Okay. So that's why being a non-resident alien is really the gold standard in the world today. It's, you know, it's the only way to, you know, not be treated, uh, you know, as, as a card carrying member of the American Tax Form and Penalty Club, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I would also say this, all right, now that you've got me thinking about this stuff, um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but here goes. <laughs> um, there were there were changes to the tax residency rules for uh, who was a non-resident alien that took effect on January first, nineteen eighty four. And let me tell you about that. Um, prior to nineteen eighty four, the whole issue of whether you were a U.S. resident uh, was sometimes not clear. You know, it was the result of court decisions and you know balancing this and balancing that. So. Changes to the Internal Revenue Code in 1984 effectively meant that as long as you had a green card and you had not formally abandoned it, okay, you were still considered to be a U.S. tax resident. So, I mean, just think what that means practically for me. You mean, you got all these people. And by the way, I deal with these people today, okay, today. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's a major part of what I do, all right? Uh, you know, so these are people who had moved to the U.S. with a green card. They'd stay for a few years, you know, and then they'd move back to wherever, you know, thinking that's it. I don't live in the United States anymore. They'd stop filing taxes. And mostly they never heard from, you know, from the IRS or anything like that. But what happened in 1984 was that the law was written so that they are still subject to U.S. tax rules and tax residency unless they you know, formally abandon uh, the green card by filing an I-407 or it's forcefully taken away from them or, you know, in later years if they were to make a certain kind of tax treaty election. But my point is that that change in 1984, right, uh, also massively expanded the U.S. tax base, right? Because all of a sudden, uh, people who thought they were no longer non-resident aliens were still oh. non-resident aliens. See what I'm saying? So what's fascinating about this, and this is this I think should be written up as a separate blog post, because I've never, I don't know that I've really had this conversation with anybody before. So thank you for this, Anthony. But <laughs> but the, the thing about it is that I think it's very reasonable to say that most of the tax problems today are the result of changes in citizenship law and immigration laws. Yeah. You know, with, you know, some pretty brutal tax amendments thrown in, right? Right. Yeah. We, we, yeah. Random, terrible things thrown in there. But that that's it. I mean, there there it is, is that we have seen and this this demonstrates the problem when you don't define it, when you don't define what individual meant. And look, and I would say this in 1954, if we were all there and everyone signing this law said, yeah, we mean, I said, okay, so it, when you're, when you're talking about individual, do you mean a U.S. resident? Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Do you mean a U.S. resident who's over 21? Uh, what, yeah, how old, right? Uh, do you mean a U.S. resident who is legally mentally incapacitated? Because we impose filing obligations on people who do not have the mental ability to know they're even alive. And the worst That's, penalties, and the worst penalties. A, a, right, a non-delegable duty to people who have no idea what's going on, and which is completely absurd. And that's completely absurd when you don't define individual because, well, we never exempted people who are mentally capacitated. Yeah. We never we never exempted people in a coma from their filing obligations. Therefore, well, you have to do it. 
yet you have to do it. So that's kind of, you're absolutely right. The destruction, the, the tax code hasn't been as fundamentally changed as what all these words mean in their vague carve outs. Yeah. You know, well, let me make a suggestion for, you know, what, what I think, and, you know, certainly I've argued this uh, in the past, um, but this, this seems like a good moment. So I think the first, the first point without going too far with it is that, you know, we're looking in the 1950s. I think most people, when they saw the word individuals thought of residents. Okay. okay? You know, that, that's what they're thinking about. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, uh, you know, Treasury has regulations for many, if not most, sections of the Internal Revenue Code. And there is a Treasury regulation that does define individual. Okay. And that's right in Section 1. And it does say citizen or resident. Okay. Now, here's the thing, right? Though, so if we look at what citizen uh, or resident meant at that time, right, um, it doesn't mean the same thing it means today. Right. right, because, you know, if we're looking pre-Aforium, that was the seminal U.S. Supreme Court decision on citizenship, that's Aforium. So if we look, pre, look at pre-Aforium, you know, in the 50s, I mean, it's, everybody knew, well, anybody who knew anything about this would know that if you became a citizen of another country, you would have lost U.S. citizenship, right? Or if you voted in a foreign election or served in foreign armed, you know, or, you know, a variety of things, you'd lose U.S. citizenship. So the point is that from a practical perspective, all right, you know, Americans who moved overseas and became citizens of another country would have lost their U.S. citizenship, right? You know, so this would not yeah. apply yeah. to them necessarily. And what I think, therefore, needs to happen, since, you know, Treasury's view is obviously that it does have regulatory authority over the meaning of individual, is that... Uh, I think they need to change the meaning of individual to update it to something reasonable or rational, uh, you know, reasonable or rational uh, for the uh, for the 21st century. And, you know, I think that might very well include, you know, people who have, uh, you know, become dual citizens or something like that, you know, perhaps should not have this whole thing applied to them. But, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like this, okay? Uh, what we have is, um, you know, a, a set of laws that were perhaps not totally offensive at the time they were enacted in the 50s, but it didn't keep up with the times and external changes in immigration and citizenship completely changed the dynamic, coupled with a bunch of horrible laws thrown in. And the meaning of citizen or in a resident just does not mean the same thing in 2022 as it did in the 1950s. Not at all. And so I would invite, and I think it's entirely reasonable for Treasury to exercise its authority and narrow the definitions here. Does that make sense to you, Anthony? Well, I think they really need to because, well, if they don't, if they don't, because I'm looking at this, and of course, now I look through everything through my new favorite lens called West Virginia versus EPA. I'm looking this through that lens. I am looking through this law through that lens to say, okay, well, and again, you're 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 describing the very exact reasoning besides West Virginia versus EPA. We signed this law, we got this. And there's no accountability for this because you voted for this but you got this. Yeah. So in 1954, this country, okay, whatever way, decides to define, uh, you know, define individual or just decides to re re up their, their income tax. Forgetting something, forgetting something very important. Well, but we all know what it means though. But the thing is when you all know what it means, you don't need to define it, right? You don't need to, you don't need to, you know, when everyone knows what it means it, you don't have to. And now the biggest, the biggest change, and I mean a fundamental change, a difference between life and death for somebody, really. I mean, honestly, I mean, a massive fundamental change that not one person, not one person in Congress and not one president ever signed into law. No one ever did that. 
No one ever signed a law that said, you know what we want to do? We want to specifically tax every carbon-based life form, and we're just going to have these carve-outs. No one ever voted for that. Zero. And so that's something. I don't know. Nobody ever thought about it. You know, they they thought, I mean, I'm sure they probably thought that, uh, you know, all they were doing by using the word individual, they meant residents. I yeah. think, yeah, what I think Absolutely. is that the language individual in section one and the carve out for non-resident aliens in section two, I honestly, now, now bear in mind, Anthony, okay, now you really got my brain going, <laughs> okay, bear in mind that at the time that that would have been enacted, remember that, um, you know, again, there was no statutory definition of non-resident alien, right? It was a facts and circumstances test based on actual connection to the United States, right? And, and if you didn't have the connection, you were gonna be a non-resident alien. So the way the thing was probably conceived was, you know, uh, those in, though you're an individual, if you have a connection to the United States that would justify taxation, and the carve out for non-resident aliens based on the understanding of that at the time was, but we're not going to apply that U.S. source income accepted to people who don't have that kind of connection to the United States, right? So, you know, it may not have been completely irrational at the time as it was seen to be, but you see how, you know, the evolution of other laws, right? And frankly, an absolutely, you know, stupid set of people in government, uh, you know, coupled with the fact that obviously the U.S. would see it to its advantage to keep expanding the tax base, right? You know, the collage of all those factors has brought us where we are today. And that's why, you know, leaving aside the issue of uh, West Virginia and EPA, I mean, you know, that, that will gradually evolve as well. But I do believe that the or a solution to this runs through Treasury uh, redefining citizen and resident by regulation. I think it's in their best interest. Uh, <laughs> well, what, I what would it's everybody's best interest? Right. So what? So so um, they can re, um, um, they can redefine. So, I mean, how? What would you say their limitations on how should it be redefined? Well. Um, I think it, I think it needs to be I think it needs to be redefined in a way that citizenship is severed from the definition altogether. Yep. Because that's incredibly hard. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, I think that a resident has to mean some kind of uh, connection center of gravity, which would have you to the United States in the way that other countries do it. I mean, you know, you can have pretty uh, sticky tax residency. I'm not promoting the Canadian one. It's just the one I know best, right? But I mean, yeah. you know, you can have pretty sticky tax residence with a Canadian uh, definition, which is sort of ordinarily resident, which sort of means this, Anthony, that, uh, uh, you know, whether you're, whether you're in Canada or not, most of the time, if... Um, your family's in Canada, your kids are in Canada, your credit cards are in Canada, you know, you have enough stuff in Canada, yeah. all right? Uh, yeah, you can sever tax residency, but you're going to be subject to the departure tax rules, you know, sort of thing, right? Um, you know, I mean, I'm embarrassed. You know, so we talk about the brutality of the U.S. tax system all the time. I've got, I've, I've really got to say that Canada's got a very brutal system too, just for the record, okay? Well, here we are in North America, you know, tax evil, the access of tax evil. Well, absolutely. Well, let's check in with Keith because here's a, here's a, here's an issue of his expertise. So Keith, you've been listening to us here. What do you say as our resident layman? What's your, what do you say? Here? My re resident layman? No, it's a very interesting discussion and I've been silent because I learn a lot from the two of you to apply to what I'm doing. I do have one question I'd like to ask. Um, and this is based on what it is today. And I hear John talking about, obviously, severing U.S. citizenship from tax residency. That is the solution. Unfortunately, that's not the situation today. So my understanding is, is that the, because of subsequent laws, 
on citizenship that have been uh, passed, it has expanded uh, who is a U.S. citizen and the tax base. So here's what has come up from time to time. You have someone, and I'll just give an example. You have someone who thought they lost their U.S. citizenship because they took another citizenship and they did it many years ago. So let's say, I think, John, you talked about 1967. So let's say it was in 1965. And you fast forward to today, they never got a CLN, but today, all of a sudden, they're now considered a U.S. citizen. So they have no proof to state, no, I'm not a U.S. citizen because I took French nationality back in 1965. You see what I mean? Meaning that the fight is a U.S. person, even though based on the law at that time, they gave up their U.S. citizenship. So there are a group of people who are caught in this in this hole, this quagmire, because they have to get rid of their U.S. citizenship for a second time. Uh, so, so you're saying so so basically when the, the laws, laws have been expanded. Well, one last point. Yeah, sure. One last point. One last point. Sorry. So my thing is, is that when the citizenship is expanded, is it retroactive, or does it go from moving forward? Voila. That's where wow. a number of people oh, are caught up in this. Keith, it may surprise you, but I think I can answer your question. Mm-hmm. If you like. Okay. All right. So yeah. what you're what you're really envisioning is uh the people are having the bank account problem, right? Well, it. yeah, and it, it, well, not just the bank account problem. That is a problem, okay? But now they're being identified as someone that needs to file US tax declarations every year. But they were under the knowledge of not being a U.S. citizen anymore because they took another citizenship back in the night. And there are a lot of people out there like that. Sure. Okay. So So where do they fall in all this? Yeah. Yeah. Here's what I think the answer is. Um, Okay. First of all, this is something I've written on fairly extensively, and I'll send you a a blog, probably one of my better blog posts on this topic. But let me start with a conclusion and then I'll work backwards. Okay, so what happened on June 3rd, 2004 was that all US citizens, because we know that US citizenship is the greatest and the bestest, right? I mean, they were actually given a second US citizenship, right? One was great, but two Mm -hmm. even greater more than twice as greater. They were given taxes. Yeah. So in June 3rd, 2004, the U.S., for all citizens who were, had citizenship for nationality purposes, also got tax citizenship. My view of this is that those who lost U.S. citizenship for nationality purposes prior to June 3rd, 2004, I think of a very strong case. They're not U.S. citizens for any purpose whatsoever. Now, I agree with you that it's complicated and I agree that, you know, depending on which side of the issue you're on, you can probably marshal various arguments. But here's, here's the deal on this, okay? Um, what, so, so I mean, the first point is if you lost citizenship for nationality purposes prior to June 3rd, 2004, and you believe that you are not a US citizen from that point on, never, you know, claimed any benefits of it or anything, then I think that you should stick to your guns. You're not a U.S. citizen for either nationality purposes or tax purposes. Now, here's where the problem is. So let's use your example of 1965. And this is something I'm very familiar with because uh, less so now, because I've been doing this a long time. In the earlier years, I get a lot of U.S. draft dodgers, okay, who are concerned about this issue because you know, they, for example, would move to Canada in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they became uh, Canadian citizens. And at that time, I mean, the law was crystal clear, the statutory law, that if you became a 
a Canadian citizen, you'd lose your US citizenship and that was that. And, that. and they understood that that is what would happen, okay? And, you know, they became Canadian citizens with the full knowledge, expectation and understanding they were losing, they were relinquishing their US citizenship. So in 1967, the Euphorium decision comes down. What that means, okay, in the simplest possible terms I can explain it is, the Congress cannot strip people of their citizenship unless the person doesn't want to be a citizen anymore, no matter what the law says. So after the Euphorium decision came down, um, you know, that opened the door for people becoming dual citizens, you know, basically and not automatically losing oh, U.S. citizenship. Okay. The State Department completely ignored the Euphorium decision completely, okay, and kept on stripping people of their citizenship regardless. Until 1980, there was a second Supreme Court decision, Vance versus Teresa, that you know read the State Department, the Riot Act, and made it very, very clear that these statutory expatriating acts, like becoming a citizen of another country, did not result in loss of citizenship, no matter what the law said, unless it was accompanied with an intent to relinquish U.S. citizenship. Now. What then happened was that a number of people were sort of retroactively invited to reestablish their US citizenship, or they were told they were US citizens. Now, some people said, well, wonderful, uh, I'm gonna be a US citizen, but others did not. They said, no, 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 you know what? I fully intended, I committed this expatriating act of becoming Canadian with the full intention of relinquishing US citizenship and I'm not a US citizen, that's it, okay? Now there's a lot of people in that group and those people I think should take the position they're not US citizens for any purpose whatsoever, you know, unless they held themselves out to be or something like that. Now, where this is a problem now is people being identified by banks with a US place of birth and what to do. Now, the FACA IGAs uh, are very, very specific on how to cure the problem of a U.S. birthplace. And it's either through a CLN or if a CLN is not available, it's done uh, through a combination of showing that you're a citizen of another country coupled with a reasonable explanation of why you don't have a CLN. So what do you do? Well, uh, you know, you write a fact of self-certification with a reasonable explanation that more or less uh, goes through the laws I just described, coupled with the factual predicates to get them over the top. And I, you know, I've written, I don't know how many, but like a real lot of these, okay, <laughs> for people over the years. Yeah. And uh, in all but one case, they've been successful. Um, I mean, there are certain banks uh, that, you know, are a real problem. Okay, uh, one in Canada in particular, which I won't name, but um, you know, for the most part, uh, this works. And I would add also that the directive from the Canada Revenue Agency on this, uh, if anybody is listening to this who's in Canada, is that uh, they agree with what I just said, namely that somebody who committed an expatriating act prior to June, June 3rd, 2004, should be taking the position they're not a U.S. citizen. You know, if that's what they want to do. So. Um, so that, that will your question that, to a point, and thank you. Um, it, it it certainly satisfies the situation when it comes to their local banks. Okay. However, even if the self certification is accepted, that's great for the bank, but they're still considered in U.S. government eyes as someone that needs to file a U.S. tax declaration where do you each get year. That information. Where, where do you where do you get that information? Well, I mean, I've had a, as far as I know, the, the position of the IRS is that citizens and residents have to file 1040s. Right. So, so my question. Why would you file a 1040 if you're not a citizen? <sighs> well, the answer, I'll give you the answer you want. The answer is because of 877A of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, which can be read, which can, but doesn't have to be read retroactively, okay? Now, there are certain tax and accounting firms who, the, that, that's the exit tax rules, by the way, was enacted June 16, 2008, who um, have chosen to read that statute retroactively to mean that anybody who doesn't have a CLN, nobody was getting certificates of loss of nationality back then, 
anybody right. who doesn't have a CLN is still a U.S. tax resident. I think that's flat right. out wrong. Uh, and there are a number of other lawyers who think that's flat out wrong. Um, you know, now I don't, I know of one case where the individual outlined everything, why that person, uh, when they took French citizenship, they did it with the act of relinquishing, if I'm using the proper term there, they of their the U.S. citizenship. Relinquishing U.S. citizenship. That, that's the language you're looking for. Right. And they wrote this to uh, the State Department. And the State Department denied their explanation and said, mm -hmm. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah, there, there, are, there, are some, there are some situations like that. But now let's be very, very careful here, Keith. We're talking about yeah. different things, different branches of the U.S. government. Right. Now, um, over the years, it has become much more difficult to get certificates of loss and nationality, you know, what are frequently called backdated, based on, based on past expatriating acts. A lot of people are unable to get them because they just, you know, they just make mistakes. They think it's easy. They're wrong. Okay, they make mistakes and they find out they don't get them. So there's a lot of there's a lot of them out there. Okay, uh, they had bad they had bad advisors. All right, or something. You know, I mean, because these things need to be done, you know, in a very very specific way. But the point I really want to make here is that's a determination from the State Department that you're not a U.S. citizen. Now, my answer to that is that the Rules for relinquishing of U.S. citizenship in Section 349A of the Immigration and Nationality Act do not require a CLN to validate it. They simply do not. You know, this is based on having committed the relinquishing act. Now, I agree that this is a problem for the U.S. government, and that's why they created the tax citizen in June 3rd, 2004, but it didn't exist prior to June 3rd, 2004. And I mean, I think the issue is simply this. I mean, you know, did the person's conduct prior to June 3rd, 2004, did it or did it not, amount to a relinquishment of U.S. citizenship under the only law that mattered, which was the Immigration and Nationality Act, right? right. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think it's dealer's choice. Uh, you know, if you want to go get a CLN, I'd be very careful on how to do that, okay? Usually I'm not... Uh, super strong in these podcasts and go out and spend money on professional advisors, but by God, I'm going to do it here because, you know, I have, you know, I'm getting more and more calls from people. Oh, it was rejected. You know, I look at it and I know, you know, I can tell why it was rejected. Um, and it's difficult to appeal. these. difficult. All right. And it you know, it takes yeah. a lot of time. So, you, you know, if you're going to go there, but the thing is you don't have to do that. Because if you lost U.S. citizenship prior to June 3rd, 2004, unless you believe that 877A is retroactive, and I do not believe that, okay? Uh, don't mm -hmm. let somebody convince you of that without explaining why. Yeah, yeah. All right? Uh, then I think your position is you're not a U.S. citizen for any purpose. I agree that mm -hmm. renunciation of citizenship is, is easy to do. Okay, and a lot of people say, well, why would I get, you know, help on that? Well, the answer is, okay, because it's not the renunciation, it's the problem, it's the consequences, right? You know, that, that you want to deal with. But the backdated relinquishments are very, very difficult to get, okay? And I, right. most people are not going to get them uh, on their uh, left of their own devices. Uh, we're, well, we're out of time today. So let me just summarize what we have discovered today. Then this is sort of, I think, some some big discoveries for all of us today. First of all, that we can say that that it's not necessary. While the income tax has expanded in rather arbitrary and punitive waves here and there internationally, the real danger has come from changes that are outside the U.S. tax code. Um, various changes, uh, Supreme Court changes and law changes to what it means to be a citizen. Um, those in regulations has left things in the air. Underlying the problem with the income tax as is individual is not defined other than by carve out. And when you do this, this is and if and actually, if you listen to Keith's voice, what he's concerned about is this. He's got real people. He knows what the law is. And people aren't following the law. While this shouldn't be a problem for a lot of people, what happens when it is?
What happens when a bank doesn't recognize a law and you might not have the money or the resources or the ability or the ability to speak English to hire a professional to help you with your U.S. tax problem that you are no longer a citizen of nor have any contact. And that's what we're really seeing. So what are we going to look forward into the future? Perhaps there'll be a challenge to this, like EPA versus commissioner, or perhaps we'll look for some regulation, regulatory fixes. By the way, and this is the pressure I would say to the government to fix this regulation, you might not like what the Supreme Court defines individual. Maybe they divide an individual as somebody who actually consents to this garbage. With that, this is Anthony Parent for IRS Medic. I want to thank John Richardson so much and Keith Redmond for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe. Thanks again for watching. Okay.